but I also recognized that being so young, I didn't necessarily have the emotional tools. So this is where, you know, when the rejection process in my first transplant began, I had to really track back and almost like view like a film, all of that. Um, and just to feel, feel the emotions of it, however uncomfortable and distressing it was. <laughs> Hello and welcome to A Doctor's View, a podcast looking at everyday health topics and life through a doctor's eyes. Please note that all opinions are my own and should not replace the advice given to you by your own doctor. I'm Dr. Bolivios. Let's begin. Hello everyone, welcome to A Doctor's View. I'm Dr. Bolivios. This week I'm speaking to a very inspirational lady who has taken quite a difficult health situation at a young age and turned it into a positive and is using some of the things that she's learnt in doing so to help others. So I welcome Kira Roberts. She's a holistic kidney expert, an author, a naturopathic nutritionist and also a yoga teacher. And she is joining us today from London. Hello Kira. Hello. Hello, welcome to the show. So happy to be here. Well firstly, this was going to be a face-to-face meeting, but as circumstances have changed and they seem to change every day, uh, by, the, by the hour actually at the moment, and mm-hmm. we thought it would be a better idea to have this over over a Skype conversation. I wanted to ask about your story because it's quite a fascinating one. Yes. I mean, I think quite a helpful lead-in um, that I use is to say my kidneys have been been amongst my wisest teachers. So it kind of sets, sets a scene that, you know, I've, I've had issues with a major organ system since, since I was four years old. Um, so, you know, I've, I've traversed through the whole of renal medicine, really, um, from teenage dialysis to having a cadaveric transplant at the age of 21, um, having a great run with that. Um, but, you know, that's starting to go into, luckily, a very slow rejection process. So I was able to really dive into a lot of the stuff that it was bringing up for me, which I'm hugely grateful for. Uh, And then just more recently, I had a few years on home peritoneal dialysis. And then just recently, last October, I had my second kidney transplant. So that's kind of a very, very brief summary of, of the health aspect, which, you know, that it really has been a huge learning for me on, you know, what it is to truly be alive and how we can empower ourselves through something like that. Uh, I'm not saying it's easy at all, um, but that there are there are tools that are really, really helpful along the way. Um, I suppose what makes it interesting for me, and I realize now in adulthood, reflecting back on my childhood growing up in Zambia, in Southern Africa, it was quite normal that, you know, lots of time in the sunshine, very natural exposure to vitamin D, very healthy child in spite of the nephritis diagnosis. Um, you know, and my parents treated me, well, I I think that they had probably been given the information that the disease was progressive, but they never gave me any indication of that. And I'm hugely grateful for for that. You know, they never kind of started to say, well, you need to get, you know, none, there was none of that. Hmm. Um, so it's a very free and happy child. And we ate a lot from growing in the garden and very natural. My mum has always been very interested in, you know, good food and, she did her yoga training in South Africa in the 70s. So that's kind of another big piece of what's influenced me and the work that I do today. Professionally, I have a background in credit risk and banking within the wealth management sector. But probably about seven years ago, as part of this kind of big kidney rejection process, it was it was a question to me. It's like, okay, what do you really want to do in this life? Because I don't really want to sit in this corporate chair. Um, and navigate this so yeah that was a a very compelling drive to set up my own business the wholly aligned you know helping people wholly align themselves the whole mind body spirit and of course I need to do that work I can only share from a place that I have done the work otherwise that that's not a fair place to share from sure so yeah yeah that's a a summary it's a nice summary it's a very very concise one and uh, um (laughs) you go from the diagnosis you mentioned the peritoneal dialysis just for those who aren't sure what this is could you just explain the different types of things that you've had to go through and what they all mean 
Yes, of course. So there are two uh, main forms of dialysis, which, you know, we can think of them as renal replacement therapies, but they're nowhere near as clever as our kidneys. So they really only do about 10% of what our kidneys actually do. So, you know, I love the kidneys because they are so extraordinary. They really are. Um, so when I was a teenager, I had seven years on hemodialysis. So that's the blood form of dialysis. It's accessed through um, something called a fistula in my case, which joins surgically a vein and an artery together to create a strong vessel. So you can put, you know, reasonably sized gauge needles in there. And this is typically the big machines that you see sometimes on TV with someone sitting in a chair connected up to the yes. big machine. And it's, uh, it's essentially yes. taking the role of your kidney. That's it. So it takes the blood out and, and filters it through an artificial kidney. So, you know, that very depending on what people's blood chemistry are and how they are um, overall, in terms of how they're feeling, um, treatments can vary between four and six hours, two to three times a week. Mm -hmm. So that was a very, well, in some ways a difficult setting because the unit where we were living at the time, the unit was 70 miles away from, so as a 14 year old girl having to go far away and stay two nights a week in a hospital setting in a very adult setting but I also recognized that that was a big learning ground for me to observe adult behavior through the lens of a child which you know very very privileged really to have these these adventures if you like rather than the becoming something deeply traumatic so yeah. um yeah and then the peritoneal dialysis which was um much much later so my first kidney transplant lasted almost two decades which is which is very good innings for a, yes. for a cadaveric donor as well. Yes. Um, uh, yeah, we opted for peritoneal dialysis, which is the access for that is an abdominal catheter and it uses the peritoneum, which is, you know, semi-permeable semi membranes. So through osmosis and diffusion mm -hmm. and a glucose solution that dwells mm -hmm. in the abdomen. Um, that's essentially how that works. And I chose the nighttime option. So my philosophy was, well, I'm going to be sleeping for at least eight hours. So that's fine. And then I could just get on with my day. And cadaveric transplantation, that is taking the organ from uh, a donor who has passed away. A deceased donor, correct. Yeah. Yes. And yes. as opposed to a, a live donor. A live donor, yeah. yes. So there's, a, there's a much, I, I, my understanding on kind of latest statistics is there is, there's a lot more openness now around live, live donor. Mm -hmm. um, I have a friend whose brother just over a year ago gave her a kidney so yeah they're both both options and both both are good options as well so mm -hmm. well you managed 20 years with the cadaveric so that is that is quite a quite a good stint and obviously it involves a lot of responsibility on your side as well to make sure that everything is is running as it should in terms of your you're following the instructions as they have been been advised to you Yes, well, like a combination of taking the medical advice, but also empowering myself to, you know, look after my nutrition, look after my um, psychological health. Um, yeah, which is all a journey, you know, so I'm not saying that this, you know, I was deeply psychologically aware yeah. at age 14, because I wasn't, but I can look back as an adult now and integrate yeah. that. Well, it, it's that side of things that's actually me very interested in in your story in terms of having a transplant at such a young age and having it last for 20 years and and that journey it's it's a trauma in our in, in someone's life to, to go through something like that it's not something that you expect to have to go through in life and I know you've done a lot in terms of not just with your nutrition but in terms of other things as well and I wanted to ask you about that and hopefully it could help other people as well yes absolutely and you know whilst we're doing this online obviously we've got the whole COVID-19 yes. um playing out and and you know that's bringing up huge stuff for people um, it's kind of amplifying the stuff that we already have, if you like, and we've got kind of death coming right at us on a global scale. Mm. So that brings up a lot of stuff. So one of the things that I found, you know, profoundly helpful is yoga. Um, so I had the seed planted at a young age. So for example, when we were living in Zambia, my mum used to do children's yoga classes. Um, so I had no idea on the depth of, of that. That was kind of more like, oh, you know, we're kids making shapes with our bodies and, you know, we're kind of giggling and stuff like that, as you would expect um, children to respond in that way. But as I got older, and it probably wasn't until my late 20s that I, I connected more with it, um, 
more because actually it was very stressful working in the realm of banking and very deadline driven, a lot of politics, a lot of egoic behavior. So I found just the, the class at the gym actually really, really helpful. It was a lovely teacher. Um, and that kind of reminded me, ah, you know, we can go into our bodies and we can attend and we can build strength and we can feel. And what is really exciting to me over probably really only the past two or three years, um, I did my initial training about seven years ago, uh, but all the neuroscience and the psychology that is now partnering uh, with yoga. So there's one of my teachers is actually out in California, Ashley Turner. She is a psychotherapist as well as a yoga teacher. So she's blending these things and her trainings are extraordinary for that reason, because it starts to really help us understand why it works mm -hmm. rather than thinking, you know, there's a lot of perceptions around what yoga is, that it's just some sort of flinging your body into unrealistic shapes, which is not what it is at all. Uh, the breath is actually the pillar of the practice. And, um, you know, for example, when I had my um, surgery in October, as soon as I came back from recovery, I was doing the breathing. So just this six, six pattern of breathing, coherent breath, um, it's, it's referred to profoundly helpful to just, you know, help my body to start healing, um, to make sure the emotional state rem is remaining calm. But that needs to be cultivated. It's not like I will do a few deep breaths and everything's okay. It, it, it is an ongoing practice. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's and, been a big that's been a big part of my journey. And wh when was it you first started doing that? At what point in the journey? Because I, I, obviously, I'm guessing it wasn't at the age of 14 that you started doing this. No, it was more probably you know having uh, I'd had the seed planted, but probably more in around the age of 27, 28, it was my best friend just said, oh, I've been going to this yoga class at work. Why don't you come? Mm. And, and that was, ah, oh, there's the reconnection. There's the remembering. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. And when you first started, you obviously had some idea of, of yoga with the family experience and, and everything. But how did you, how did you start? Because there'll be a lot of people that don't know where to start from. Yes. I think it was just, I think one of the great things is that a lot of these classes are now available in things like gyms. So I, th mm. I think there are a lot of people that will engage with the gym or there might be, that they might have a local yoga studio and, you know, definitely opt for a beginner's class because you don't want to end up in, you know, being massively overwhelmed and even triggered that oh, I'm not good enough. I, why did I come to this? This is a nightmare because a lot of stuff comes up in the yoga room and, uh, you know, you really need to create a very safe space as a teacher to hold that uh, and allow, allow people to do the work that they need to do, because you can't possibly know everybody's current psychological, physiological state. Uh, so it's just it's giving people permission to trust their bodies, um, yeah. which has been overridden a lot. What type of, yeah. you say a lot of things come up in the yoga room is that from during the during the class or afterward what it, it's more on like an individual level so say for example as an observer I might be seeing you know maybe 10 bodies moving in a, in, a, in a way me giving them the direction but also giving them the option to remember you can rest and you can I, you know, I have had it doesn't happen all the time but and you have to kind of build trust with people as well but uh, you know people might become quite emotional or you know for example I did a heart opening class last year uh, at the law firm and one of the the girls afterwards just she was she was like I really needed that and mm. she obviously had something going on in her life at the moment so she was you know visibly emotional mm. and and crying so you know it's important that we're allowed to do that um you know, and I know, especially for medics and people working in the NHS, you know, <laughs> I'm not encouraging people to go around crying, but there does need to be a safe space to, okay, well, I know I have that safe, safe space because, you know, maybe you've just had a very difficult interaction or witnessed something extremely distressing and traumatic, and then you're expected to just carry on with your day. So, yeah, yeah. That's, you know. I, I, that's something that I can relate to and a, a lot of medics can relate to. And often we get... Uh, I won't say criticize that's the wrong wrong word, but we, we do get the odd occasional comment of, 
oh, we find something funny that that shouldn't be funny, and uh, we, it's it's very difficult to explain, but we do use humour quite a lot in in within a hospital setting. It's not out of disrespect. It's it's purely out of it keeps us sane to some extent yeah. and yes. so sometimes yes. having this this space that you're describing actually to be able to do that I can actually understand and see how that would be very beneficial to to someone like a medic actually for sure and and actually because I've been you know I don't really like the term patient but let's just use that for the for the sake of, of logic um having been a patient within the NHS for for such a long period of time I've had plenty of interactions with varying medics um and i realize that you know whilst you know whilst orthodox medicine doesn't necessarily have a very holistic view um that has has created a lot of trigger in me on some on some level so this is where we have to do our own anger work and our own frustration work because mm -hmm. otherwise we're going to be coming from a place of trigger rather than a place of okay i've integrated my stuff mm -hmm. and yeah so that has kind of led me probably in the past two or three years to really start, okay, well, if I'm not helping to become a solution, then I'm just, I'm just not helping. So I've started to talk a lot more with medics, all kinds of people, all kinds of people. And just, you know, kind of, kind of see that there are, there are plenty of open-minded people within the system yeah. and that ultimately it's made up of humans and, and that people yearn for humanity yeah. and for connection. And that's not always encouraged. So I just say that because I, it, is, it is an area I'm very interested in. My, I actually got a bursary to uh, one of the King's Funds events last year. I think it was Compassion and Leadership. Uh, I just kind of emailed them and said, oh, hey, I'm really interested in medic well-being. And also I see you've got some patient bursaries going on. So can I have one? And they emailed me back very quickly saying, yes, we'd love to give you one. Oh. So to kind of put myself in those settings and to really observe, um, I love that I'm able to do that. Does it bring stuff up for me? Yes. But then can I go away and, and reflect upon it and integrate it and then become somebody that is able to give solutions? Then that, that's, that, that makes me feel a lot better. Sure. And I know you've said it brings stuff up to you, uh, you know, in the past. Would you mind, and by all means it can stop at any time, but would you mind just talking about some of the, the, the psychological problems and the stresses that going through something like this, because it, it's not a small thing, it's a very, very big deal having a, a transplant and just what other psychological stresses you, you would expect someone going through something similar to expect? Yeah, no, absolutely. I'm very happy to speak to this. So I recognize actually that probably it's, it's a benefit in my case to have been so young and experienced this because it means that I've, had, I've, I've integrated it on an ongoing basis. Um, and I, I, maybe a couple of years ago, became a peer supporter um, for the renal unit. So, for example, there's um, a lady who I spoke to a couple of weeks ago just on the phone who was you know in her late 30s and just suddenly have to, having to deal with oh your you know your gfr is at 7 we we need to start you on dialysis so that's really terrifying that's the measure of the kidney function yes the marrow filtration yeah. rate so that along with creatinine are, are, are you know some of the key measures of kidney function there's a lot there's a lot mm -hmm. more to it um but to be able to speak to somebody like that and hopefully provi provide them a bit of solace and reassurance and and it is is huge because mm. I totally can recognize how terrifying that must be if mm. you've lived your life up to that point with no, nothing really of major health going on and then suddenly having to deal with this and you know she was most terrified about having to have the temporary access um in her in her neck the neckline so that they could connect her to the, to the sure. hemodialysis machine so yeah, there is. And, and but I also recognize that being so young, I didn't necessarily have the emotional tools. So this is where, you know, when the rejection process in my first transplant began, I had to really track back and almost like view like a film, all of that. Um, and just to feel feel the emotions of it, however uncomfortable and distressing it was, but it was very necessary because otherwise I'm just going to be, you know, getting triggered all over the place and 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 it's not it's not healthy, you know, showing up in the kind of intimate relationships that I'm having, um, 
becoming the counsellor instead of, you know, that's very convenient to become the fixer and the counsellor in an intimate relationship because how, how great you then don't have to reveal yourself. So that I, I, you know, I've been able to recognise those patterns, yeah. which is, I think it's a gift. It's not easy. It's freaking uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah. um, but, uh, you know, I believe it's necessary. Mm. Yeah. Was there any time where there was period of depression or period of just not wanting to go out and and see the world feeling of uh almost like the stages that you go through in grief i think have been related to to uh to transplant patients yeah i mean i think definitely episodes of depression um and you know quite frankly to just like well i don't really want to carry on living this life and 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 to be honest, you know, having spoken to a lot, you know, in the line of work where I am working, you know, very closely with people's emotions and how they feel, um, I think that that's quite a common experience that we all have at some point to to consider. Okay, well, I can't see another way out, so my only exit plan is is death. Um, I do think that that you know I, we're definitely seeing that become a wider conversation. And this isn't to downplay people with you know very very distressing and of serious course. mental illness, but that we might all have those times in our lives where we're like, I I, I don't know I can't I've just kind of completely disengaged and I feel isolated. Nobody understands what I'm going through. Mm. So there's just just that those kind of feelings. But I did find that something in me would always return to hope, and that's that I realized that, okay, well, I can ride this wave because I know I'll come back to that mm. that place eventually. Was there anything that specifically triggered that the, the, a new a new change, a newfound thinking, I can I can use these things that I've learned through the various various holistic things that you've learned and actually apply them? Yeah, I mean it's it's kind of difficult in some ways to isolate an exact moment. Sure. Probably because you know, having grown up in a setting where, you know, we ate very well and, uh, you know, things just weren't available. So the kind of the panic buying that's going on now, for example, yeah. we were quite used to in Zambia at the time, just, you know, things like sugar or flour, you know, chocolate, certainly it just wasn't available. So we did eat largely from the land or from local farms. Mm. Um, but yeah, I kind of think it's just, it is always an ongoing process because life for everyone is the curriculum. Life is the learning. So you can kind of look back and, and this is what I do as I look back and think, Oh, it completely makes sense that I am where I am now. So it's kind of a series. It's a, it's a series of chapters. I actually, another valid point in my situation is I had a very wonderful pediatric nephrologist in South Africa, professor Thompson, and he, for whatever reason, and I, I'm very blessed that I had that experience. He had a very holistic approach. Yeah. He was very kind and, you know, he he would make it fun. It's like, okay, you draw, you need to drink 10 glasses of water a day, draw them in this little book every day. Um, and, you know, just said, you know, advised my mum, you know, just avoid refined sugars and all this kind of thing. So coming to the West, it was very distressing because the, the clinical advice was very, very different. And I think that prompted a lot of anger and frustration on my side mm. because I knew that there were much simpler ways to, to manage. Um, it's not to decry that you know obviously relying on a medical machine for example and that but you know to understand um what's going on and to understand the prescription medicines that you're taking um is very 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 important it's a it's a big big part yeah. of taking care of yourself yes because it's something that needs to be taken for life and it's it can a lot of people do suffer with the idea that they need to take something in order to survive. Yeah, and it's, it's a complex arena. It is a complex arena so that, you know, our immune systems are highly, highly complex and individualized and our, um, you know, the kind of whole biopsychological influences will, will impact how our immune system responds to things. So it needs to be tailored and it is, you know, people you just will discuss with the nephrologists around, well, this works for you. This doesn't work for you. So, mm. you know, I was on very, very low doses by, you know, probably after about 10 years of my first transplant. Mm. And I think that contributed a lot to its longevity. So it is a very, very key balancing act um, with the immunosuppression. So it's just about, you know, having those, those discussions um, on an ongoing basis, but yeah, there is, there are obviously um, requirements to be sensible about that as well. 
and what's your routine now? So you have uh, you, you've you've mentioned the yoga, but I'd like to talk a little bit more about that and how that the the different things you do within that to help, and also how you can get into doing that in relation to say our profession in in medicine and yeah. and some of the other things that you do as well because they're I think going to be quite relevant very very soon yes 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 so well I'll use the kind of the recent surgery as a frame of reference perhaps because that's most that's most recent um so I, I was only five days at Guy's. So we, although I'm looked after by Kings, the surgeries are done at Guy's and they were excellent. They were an amazing team. I'm very lucky to get a brilliant surgeon. Um, so yeah, and the kidney started to work straight away. I am actually going through a bit of a bump at the moment. So I've, I've had a biopsy last week and waiting the results on that. <laughs> All the uncertainty is like, should I even be going to King? So that's another thing. But just to, to there were... I was very gentle with myself. So I think being kind to yourself is very, very important, especially in these times when, you know, a lot of NHS people are obviously on the front line of everything that's going on. So being kind to yourself. Um, I, I love cooking. So doing, I just dived into home cooking and love, that was kind of my, my task is, oh, okay, what am I going to have for lunch? What am I going to have for my supper? And to really be, be in that experience of I'm creating something for myself and this is nourishing me. That really, really helped. And also, you know, the, the scar healed very, very quickly. So to just take care of your nourishment as much as you can, recognizing that food is just our physical nourishment. It's also how we nourish ourselves emotionally. Who I was very discerning about who could visit me. <laughs> I'm like, I'm not having people who are scattered and negative. Oh my God, are you okay? It's like, that's just, I don't like that. <laughs> So, you know, just my best people were, were allowed to come. Surrounding yourself with positivity. That's exactly it. Or people that you can just, you know, say, I'm not feeling great. Can we just be a bit quiet? Or whatever, you know, that that's, and I say that as a piece of advice because safe boundaries are very, very important. Um, that, you know, we often obligate ourselves. Like if we've had a friend for 20 years that we think we need to carry on with that friendship, where actually maybe, maybe you're just in different um, places at the moment and no longer serves to, to keep it going. For example, so I think, you know, being kind to yourself, be discerning about who you spend time with, which yes, is very relevant now. Mm. Um, sometimes we don't have choice, you know, in a working environment, we don't, we're not going to have those choices, but certainly in our personal lives, we can. And the, the breathing, doing regular breathing, regular meditation. I mean, for me personally, meditation has been a lifesaver. Um, and I think, again, there can be a lot of confusion around what meditation is. Yeah, just describe what you think meditation is, but also what it is that you do and something that we could do. OK, well, let, let me answer that in two parts. So I'm going to blend the coherent breath into this because actually just doing 20 minutes, for example, and it doesn't have to be 20 minutes. It's the research around 20 minutes is what's very compelling. But okay. if you start with five, that's fine. Um, so the coherent breath, if we think of what coherence actually is, it's about balance, equanimity. The coherent breath is simply a breath technique, sometimes known as 6-6 breathing. And this is a form of meditation. So just focusing on your breath is absolutely a valid form of meditation because you're just being with the inner state and you're seeing what's going on, even if it's like really uncomfortable and turbulent and horrible that you're allowing yourself to be with that. So the Coherent breath is you're breathing in through the nose for six seconds and breathing out through the nose for six seconds. It's as simple as that. I say it's as simple as that, but again, this will bring stuff up. I I studied with a guy called Ben Wolf, who's very, he's kind of a very geeky yoga teacher, which appeals to me. Uh, he's very much into the neuroscience of it all. And I, I did something called breath school with him last year mm -hmm. and it profoundly influenced the way I teach and also, you know, how I incorporated that. So you know, if, it, if that was the one thing that people were to start with, doing a few minutes of 6-6 six, six breathing, and you can do it seated, you can do it lying down, but to really encourage um, to breathe into the belly. So what we often find, especially in trauma, and actually the US military use this technique, which is interesting because they don't take things on unless they're very well researched. Yes. Um, but to, to move the diaphragm. So the diaphragm is the key breath muscle and it's designed to move at least 10 centimeters. What is happening in a very frenetic fast paced world 
is that it's almost frozen. So it might be moving a centimeter. This is a disaster for the whole biology of the body. So it really has an impact. Our breath has a profound influence on our emotional state. So, you know, we might hear in yoga circles, breathe and everything changes. And that is so true because the breath is the through line. And that, you know, I teach that a lot more in my classes. There are a lot of other yogic breath techniques, but to be quite honest, you need to be mindful with them because some are contraindicated. And, you know, if somebody who's prone to panic attacks or anxiety disorder and you give them a breath of fire, which is very kind of, you know, propelling the breath out the nose that can actually trigger them. So okay. the six, six breath is very, is very safe um, mm -hmm. and very well researched as well. So I can speak more to that if that's helpful. Yes, please do. Is it something that we, anyone can do uh, yes. and something that we can obviously doesn't take very long to do? Yeah. So, and, and I would encourage people because again, these things can sound very simple, but it's okay that stuff will come up. So part of being kind to yourself is, is like, oh no, you know, maybe you start doing it and there's, it's deeply uncomfortable because it's like, I, I, I want to, to go and make a cup of tea or, oh God, I've just remembered I need to make that phone call. And that's, that's just the, you know, the machinations of the mind. So we, we need to cultivate, um, you know, cultivating calm in these times is so important. It is important anyway, in a human experience. But what this breath helps with is balancing the whole body mind system. Um, and there's actually, I learned from Ben, this pre Botzinger complex. Have you heard of this? No. It's, it's apparently just tight. It's only made of 175 neurons. And it's, it's kind of like the respiratory pacemaker, which I think is amazing. It's just something that's so small is kind of a key, a key thing in regulating everything. And what might be helpful also for people is to look at the work of, there's two um, psychiatrists, they're actually husband and wife, uh, Dr. Patricia Gerberg and Dr. Michael Brown. And Ben did a lot of his training with them. And I've also seen them speak, but they have a lot of, research on this so that they, they've kind of come in and a lot of very for example they work with the first responders of 9-11 so some okay. very you know deeply deeply distressing traumatic experiences and then allowing them to you know be in the somatic awareness mm -hmm. of what's going on in their body um you know i had one one lady who came to i then started doing breath workshops myself teaching this who, you know, she kind of said, oh, I felt like I was drowning. And I, you know, I've had this realization of that I just have not been looking after myself. That was very powerful to come away with something like that from just a two hour workshop. So I say that hopefully to be indeed hopeful. So to give people like, ooh, is it really true? Breathe and everything changes. We'll give it a go and see how you find it. Um, but, you know, it's a practice. It's a practice. So don't do it once and then I didn't work. <laughs> it's yeah. it did work because it's made you feel and we can't keep numbing out from our feelings because it's well we can see the consequence of that mm. uh it, it doesn't it doesn't work and um you know especially for medics in you, you know who are dealing with all kinds of things on a daily basis it's yes. very important that they allow themselves um to lean into to the tools that make sense for them you know it's 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 got to be a unique process for each person yeah and in terms of meditation wise are you interchanging the breathing with with meditation or is that is it two completely different things no i mean that's an interesting question and i think it's it, it, in some ways it's very difficult to teach meditation because mm -hmm. it is a very personal experience so of course you can provide guidance around it but that you're allowing yourself to consciously observe your inner experience that's ultimately what what meditation is it's just being with yourself um and then the more you allow that you start to cultivate a sense of going beyond um well in psychology we probably call it the, the egoic identity mind in in some yoga psychology texts we might call it the lower mind uh, and what happens and sometimes people will live their whole lives from this place. We have the, the five senses, the sensory input coming in and then just the lower mind reacting, sensory input, reaction, sensory input, reaction. Now that can work in some levels, but we need to go beyond into 
what's called again in some texts the buddhi mind the wisdom mind so that we go beyond believing all of that turmoil and turbulence um but but it it is a practice i really want to emphasize that for people and you know it will always be a practice um and that you have to elect, like for example a couple of weeks ago when when my kidney function started to change, it started to bring up a lot of stuff. It's like, oh shit, you know, it's been so plain sailing for the first three months. And now I'm gonna, oh, now I'm gonna have to sit with this deep discomfort and oh, great, I'm going into panic. But thank goodness that I have the tools because then I'm, it's not, you know, I'm able to feel it, but I'm also able to draw upon that wisdom to observe that this is a temporary state. And what, you know, what, what is real in this? Because these, you're drawing upon a lot of old memories that are not, there's no evidence that this is gonna spiral out control and, you know, you could start to catastrophize perhaps. So we start to recognize our psychological patterns. That is meditation. Um, and yeah, of course it's gonna bring stuff up. It's gonna bring memories. You know, we might start to have feelings in the body. And, you know, my view is that the body is always communicating to us so that we cultivate this deep sense of inner listening that rather than, oh, I have a pain, I need to numb it. It's like, oh, I have a pain. Okay, let me go into it. What we focus on amplifies. So if we focus on, I'm in pain, it's gonna be massively amplified. If we can change the focus to, oh, there's pain. Where in the body is there not pain? Maybe I can focus on the tip of my nose or my chin. It's, it's kind of, we start to recalibrate in that way. But yeah, it might take months, years, so it's very individual. So it sounds like you use these techniques and, and everything that you've learned to allow yourself to change your perception or, or perspective rather on on certain stresses that are happening, be it through the, the things that are happening with the transplant or be it other stresses in life. And it just it sounds like it's like a reset button and it allows you just to look at something from a different point of view or in a different way and that seems to help you to deal with what it is that made you want to look at something in a different point of view yes that's a lovely summary that really is that that, no that's a lovely way of putting it because life is is how we perceive it um so our beliefs inform our thoughts our thoughts inform our behaviors so when we're being asked to change behaviors, you know, I know there's a lot of bullying and incivility that goes on in in the NHS. I went to a workshop called exactly that on that King's Fund day. And I was like, oh my gosh, I'm also like highly privileged to be listening to this, but I'm also deeply distressed by it to hear, you know, directly what people were talking about and the experience they've had. Um, So, you know, I think it's really useful for people to know that, oh gosh, maybe they've had a really grueling day at work, but they can perhaps even on their commute home just to check in um, and you know not not to have any expectations but just to check in and oh how am I feeling how am I feeling mm. how often do we actually allow ourselves to ask that of ourselves mm. so yeah we do start to change our, our perception and, and ultimately I suppose become transition from a place of obsession with personhood uh, and ego to recognizing our spiritual nature Um, you know and and everyone can really relate to this it's for example just looking out the window uh, at a tree you know if you're feeling very stressed it's just just a kind of change instead of kind of start going down that rabbit hole okay maybe I can just do some cooking or I'll make a cup of tea and and let it be a ritual There's there's a reason that humans have rituals because they're very very healing and important uh, so yeah, I mean, I find it fascinating and I can only speak from my personal experience, but I, I, I'll actually also link this in because I think it will be interesting for your listeners and, and hopefully yeah. for you as well. But I became involved um, a couple of years ago with social prescribing. Is this something that you've heard of? I've heard about it, but do please do tell us. Yes. Well, this is what I find very interesting because I ask, I ask medics along the way, oh, have you heard of social prescribing? Uh, and the, the answer is, oh, well, I'm not entirely sure. So it's it's an NHS initiative. It's part of the NHS long-term plan. And really it's it's putting, you know, it's, it's empowering health back into our communities, which is really very necessary because the NHS can't continue, to, you know, it was already on its knees, let alone with something like this coming along. I mean, I, yeah. I can totally understand that, what a nightmare it must be. Um, but social prescribing, I run two community classes a week in South London. So the people that the classes are free, 
Interestingly, my Crystal Palace one has just had the NHS England funding cut. So I don't know what's going on with that, but the good news is that people, like we want to keep this going, we'll just do a donation. That, so that's amazing. We'll see if we can get funding from elsewhere. Um, but the other class continues to get that funding via the GP practice. So I, I think that that's very hopeful because it kind of gives, you know, ho hopefully GPs who I know are under an awful lot of pressure, um, you know, some signposting to, uh, you know, maybe this, you can go to this community yoga class, or maybe you can go to this community debt advice that we've arranged. So the idea is to kind of, you know, remind ourselves of the power of community. And actually this time that we're going through now is, you know, perhaps finding your virtual communities at the moment and, you know, talking to people more on the phone, you know, if you haven't mm -hmm. spoken to a friend for a long time, just checking in, oh, how are you doing? Yeah. So that, that kind of reminds us to connect and to, to be generous. Um, but we can only be generous if we're filled up from within. Yes. The, it's very difficult to be generous when we're depleted. The, the talking on the phone thing's actually something I can relate to very recently. I just had a, had a friend phone me and it's it's quite unusual now to get a phone call from a friend normally things are done on a on a screen and yeah. uh, it was it was out the blue and just to say uh, i'm thinking of you uh, in this time and and that was that was something that was very it was very nice you know it left me with a smile on my face the rest of the day and yes. yeah so the, the just talking to people that you haven't spoken to in a long time or just someone that pops into your head is actually i think quite a quite a powerful tool I totally agree because it is ultimately we, we we are driven by how we feel um yeah. you know so one of the reasons addiction is so rife because yeah. you know it's not the actual substance we're addicted to it's how it makes us feel so yeah, yeah which is yeah so if we can get a call that makes us feel oh oh you know smile on your face the rest of the day seriously I mean that's very powerful medicine yes actually it really, it really was and it was very yeah. well appreciated so moving on from from now if obviously we're in a very stressful situation um we will have there'll be times where had a long day as as uh, many people do and i'm sure many of your clients have and what it is what is it that you think would be the most useful thing you come in keys go on the hook or by the door wherever and you've just sat down what would you advise I guess it's going to depend on the context, if we're living alone or not. I'm mm -hmm. I'm fortunate, well, this I see it as fortunate that I do live alone. Um, my sister, on the other hand, is preparing for her two children <laughs> and her sure. husband all, all being in the same house. She's like, oh, God, here we go. It's going to be a freaking nightmare. Um, so I guess it's kind of understanding your context and just coming in and maybe even just kind of taking one or two deep breaths so that it's that that physical and psychological connection with I've come through the door, I've put the keys down. So connecting with those as being transition movements mm. to, OK, I'm going to allow myself to switch off, even if it's just a little bit, because the more we practice that, the more the neural pathways will be reset, because even the action of putting the key in the door then becomes a, a a reminder to your neural pathways ah we're home so you know we're home like where is home home is ultimately where the heart is so it's kind of even something as simple as that somatic connection a hand on heart that it could be something oh, i'm going to put the kettle on just have a little moment hand on heart take a deep breath and just see how it makes you feel it's you know it makes me feel very comforted it might make somebody else feel very annoyed <laughs> but just just play around with these things you know tune in to yourself and people wanting to get into the yoga side of things where would be the best a good resource uh, is there some beginner videos you recommend or because uh, i've seen you can start this on youtube by yourself you don't need to go into a, a class yeah. to just just get things going you can have it connected to your tv screen and no one around you can just crack on and do yes. uh, you know do the odd class and is there would you recommend doing that is there some specific resources that you think are very good yeah i mean I, I can give a couple um i'm kind of growing my youtube channel at the moment so that that's um you know there are some on there but there's certainly others uh, i think yoga with adrian i think she's an okay. american lady she has got loads on there so but also just kind of go in and have a look, you know, if you're looking, I don't know, for example, yoga for stress relief, just, just Google that. There will be a ton of stuff that will come up. Um, 
and just remember it just like oh god I don't want to just do a whole lot of physical movement it's not necessarily going to be that it might be oh here is a 10 minute medita- guided meditation for mm-hmm. you to you know get your cortisol levels down to reconnect mm-hmm. with you know the here and now um so something simple like that I also you know in terms of reaching out to more uplifting resources and drawing upon that especially in these times I love the teachings of um a man called Muji, M-O-O-J-I. He's actually, you know, he's a, he used to be an incense seller in Brixton. So I probably over the years might have seen him, but just, you know, this gorgeous man with dreadlocks and he's kind of ended up transitioning into, into carrying a very spiritual role. And I've seen him in person and I've listened to quite a lot of his teachings and they're very, they're very sensible because he calls it the invitation, you know, the invitation to just, see what's going on but he will articulate it far more beautifully than I can so th- those can be really really helpful just and he's got loads of stuff on YouTube mm-hmm. um from very short things to much longer so it really depends on what you feel you want to embrace okay. at the moment and just for, for those listening who are thinking this sounds all, all well and good but don't have time for this it, it, it make me feel a bit silly doing it um, by myself could you just tell us some of the things that you've experienced with with clients because I understand you work with quite big city clients and different corporations and they obviously come to you for this type of experience and to help with with stress and to help with team bonding and and things like that so just tell us how it's yeah. affected them yeah I mean I think it's it's also kind of especially if you're doing it on your own just notice if you've got self-conscious patterns coming up because, you know, at the end of the day, just kind of say, well, listen, I'm just going to give this a go. Um, and just, you know, just start, just start, even if it, if it feels ridiculous and silly, but that it will, you know, ultimately it's the hero's journey. I kind of reference Joseph Campbell's work here, who did a lot of work around mythology and understanding the human spirit. And he coined the phrase, follow your bliss, which has annoyed some people to some extent. It's like, just for our bliss that's highly impractical um he later said apparently i, I wish i'd said follow your blisters because it is it's like yeah we've got to follow, follow follow our pain patterns and see how we can unpick them so just starting by you know have more confidence in yourself don't give yourself such a hard time you know d- don't think oh let go of perceptions of what you think yoga is because it really you'll find what you need there's plenty of resources on there and you'll find what you need um and, and also kind of looking at maybe some some other work that feels a bit more practical, you know, the work of people like Brené Brown, The Power of Vulnerability, which not necessarily yoga, but, you know, it's kind of really saying the same things around perennial wisdoms of, you know, what is it that keeps us well? It's actually rich simplicity. So don't, you know, don't hold yourself back from from taking a path that is ultimately going to lead to transformation. Um so yeah, just just give things a go. And if you feel like, oh, I, I just can't do it, then just start, you know, maybe stand up and roll your shoulders, give yourself a stretch. Just connect with how your body feels. You, do, mm-hmm. you know, if, if your mind at the moment is telling you, you know, yoga's BS or whatever, it's like, that's fine, that's fine. But, you know, just just see how just moving your body. We know, I mean, you, you, you all know as medics as well, the, the importance of physical movement. Uh, and how that is important for our emotional state as well so just start somewhere don't worry about it just and just let go of being self-conscious it's it's just explore enjoy the exploration and, you know that's yeah. a nice that's the way of putting it actually enjoy the exploration yeah. yeah yeah well thank you so much it's been lovely talking to you and i uh, hope we can use some <laughs> of these welcome. techniques in the next upcoming weeks and um you know our thoughts with with everyone on the front line of this and hoping that they can find some like you said earlier some solace with even just little things and to try and help them through difficult time and uh, for everyone who's stuck at home as well uh, in 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 the isolation period uh, this potentially is a good time to think about doing doing the odd movement like what you're describing and it could be quite beneficial too yeah no exactly and just I just remember you did ask me about working with corporate clients so Mm. you're just around there's um, a law firm that I do a couple of classes at so they asked if we could move the classes online so that's what we're doing so I suppose it's the power of adaptability as well Um, Mm. and and just you know I see a lot of commonalities in sort of behaviors and stresses amongst medics and lawyers because they're groups that I work quite a lot with yeah Um, 
so perhaps that reassures people that oh like lawyers and you know yes. <laughs> they're doing it i do a, a class for the partners which are mostly men and you know men in their 50s and they all they all come in and they really enjoy it so it's That's fantastic yeah yeah well thank you very much and i wish you all the very best for the upcoming weeks as well and um also for the future with with everything and the biopsies and hope everything comes back okay thank you paul i appreciate it and i i you know i really send a lot of love to everyone who's working in the nhs at the moment um you know we we do appreciate the work that you do massively and equally if there's anything that i can do more if you know if it's helpful if people would like me to create some sort of video or something i'm very happy to do that so i just want you know i want to put that out there because it's you know i'm in a space where i'm able to be generous um, and, and enjoying my self-isolation, I appreciate that's not going to be the case for many other people who are, you know, losing their jobs or, you know, having to then be in a family situation that's highly stressful. So, uh, I, you know, I, I'm I'm able to do that. So I, I'd be delighted to do that if it's helpful. Thank you very much, Kiri. I'll put definitely put links to you in the description as well, so anyone can get in touch with you as well. Yeah, great. Thank, thank you. Thank you. That was Kira Roberts, author of Holy Aligned, Holy Alive, and I will leave links to her book in the podcast description. As with many of the fascinating guests that I've had on this show, after the show ends, we often have quite an interesting discussion off air. And one thing that's very clear about Kira is just how positive she is and just how willing she is to help others in a stressful situation or in a stressful job, including medics. And on that note, she gave me a list of exercises to try and do and some things that may help de-stress. And at the start of the series in my trailer, I did explain that I would be trying to do some things that I wouldn't normally do to try and improve quality of life and health and just general sense of well-being. And so I've taken it upon myself to do the challenges and exercises that she's set out for me. And they include different breathing techniques and also some very simple stretches as well. So I will do that and I will report back in a few weeks to see how easy it's been and also what improvements I've noticed. Before ending the show, it goes without saying that our thoughts and hearts are with everyone involved in battling this virus that is crippling the world at the moment. And that doesn't just involve hospital workers. Uh, This involves every key worker out there, pharmacists, the shop owners, the police officers, the fire brigade, everyone who is involved in trying to keep this country running uh, as normal as possible under the circumstances. And also our thoughts are with the parents who aren't able to go to work at the moment and who are having to look after children uh, in a very difficult environment. So uh, a massive, massive thank you to everyone out there. That's it for this week. If you are enjoying the show, please do subscribe or follow and please do leave a review. If you have any questions that you'd like me to answer or any topics that you'd like me to discuss in the future, please do email me at a doctorsview at gmail.com or visit me at a doctorsview.co.uk and I am on Instagram at a doctorsview. I look forward to joining you again next time and as always, please look after yourself. I'm Dr. Polivios. Goodbye. Goodbye.